Hey everyone, I'm David Grinspoon. I'm an astrobiologist and I study how planets get life and how they lose life. And welcome to The Breakdown. All right, let's start with the day after. What's going on? Those are Miniman missiles. Like a test, sort of. Like a warning? Of all the sort of post-disaster depictions, to me, th this is, in a way, the most actually frightening because it's a, <laughs> it's a real thing that they tried to make a realistic uh, film of. And I, I remember, actually, when th this was on. I'm watching this and I'm thinking, where are these people running to? How is it going to really help? I mean, in theory, you know, you get down in the basement. And yeah, you know, you can avoid the immediate effects of fallout if you shelter in place and don't breathe that outside air with the dust. And if you get enough in a basement or something, you might es escape the radiation if you're not literally in the blast zone. It's just, I'm also looking at these people and thinking, yeah, so what are you gonna do a few days from now, <laughs> you know? How long do the radioactive effects last? So there's the immediate pulse of, there's some, these short-lived radionuclides that if you manage to shelter in place and not breathe that air and breathe the falling dust, you know, for, for a few days, and then you get out, you're much better off. That's the theory is that like, you, there is something you can do to stay alive immediately and then, you know, maybe, maybe that's the only town that got nuked and you can get to another one, you know, but uh, <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> okay, let's skip ahead here. Yeah, boy, that doesn't look like fun at all. The first thing I noticed was that the electromagnetic pulse was depicted. If the blast doesn't get you and the radiation doesn't get you, the electromagnetic pulse will make all our electrical machines stop working within a certain radius. And then the explosion itself is frighteningly convincing to me. You know, I'm not sure about that scene where all the people sort of turn into skeletons, but even that, I think that's an attempt to depict the fact that there's these x-rays that are pouring out of the thing that are frying everybody. And it's even conceivable that you would see something like that in your last, you know, microsecond of consciousness <laughs> before it happened to you too. <laughs> Yeah, I think, I think that is pretty well depicted as far as I understand it. First of all, there'd just be a completely blinding flash of just radiation so intense that everything would be white in every direction, even with your eyes closed. If that didn't blind you and you were still able to see, then yeah, there'd be this massive mushroom cloud, which is simply, you know, the thermal pulse immediately expanding this volume of, of air, which is, is low density because it's so hot and it just, it rises like a giant bubble into the stratosphere. And whenever you release that much energy near the surface of, of the planet, you're gonna get, you know, a bubble like that that just inexorably rises up and forms that mushroom. I mean, everything left would, would burn. You know, the aftermath of a nuclear explosion in a city is a firestorm massive, massive amounts of smoke and debris heading up into the stratosphere. And by the way, that's why you get a nuclear winter, which is the real main threat of the aftermath of the nuclear war, you know, after all those immediate effects. And that is because of all the smoke that ends up in the stratosphere. So those firestorms, it's actually not from the nuclear bomb itself, but from the fires created all the burning cities. Collectively, they make enough smoke that it circulates around the planet in the stratosphere, and it's gonna block out the sun for two years. Again, the best uh, approach is to not let this happen. <laughs> I mean, the day after seems very real to me. It's got this kind of heaviness to it that I still feel when I see it, even though I'm also going like, well, that was the 80s and we've survived till now, so <laughs> that didn't happen. <laughs> and now this is the fifth wave. Thank you. Come on, sir. It's not yeah, okay, so they're by a lake. The broad strokes of this seem realistic to me. Earthquakes are kind of short and, and there's a sort of jolt and then they end. I've been in an earthquake and that seemed pretty, pretty well done. And then the idea that the wave comes, that is realistic in broad terms. That's the thing with the tsunami is that they, it comes a while later. But what I'm wondering is the volume, the concentrated pulse of water from a lake 
I'm not convinced that it works out in terms of the size. Because the earthquake, they looked like they were ex experienced. It seemed like, yeah, it was a major earthquake, but it wasn't like Krakatoa or the ground blow blowing up to bits. And that was, yeah, that was a very, very powerful tsunami. That's what I picture tsunami looking like if you experience it. It's, you know, that's sort of the first rush of water and then it more and more and more. And, you know, we've seen footage in Japan in Sendai, which, you know, was the first really modern tsunami with like that kind of footage of it crashing into these urban areas. And, you know, that, that looked pretty, pretty realistic to me. Let's check out Waterworld. The polar ice caps have melted, covering the earth with water. Those who survived have adapted to a new world. So, both probable and improbable. The polar ice caps can melt. They have in the past melted completely. They're on their way towards melting now, and that does raise sea level. But it doesn't raise sea level so much that the entire Earth is covered with water. It raises sea level so much that the oceans are larger and the land mass is comparatively smaller. You know, many times actually, Earth has been ice free in its history. You know, not, not recently, not since human beings have been here. So this is, you know, a realistic threat and a possible future where the Earth would be ice free and there'd be a lot more ocean than there is now. And that would change life on Earth for sure. But it's taken to an extreme that, that you would never see happen. Interestingly, in my field, astrobiology, we consider the possibility of life on a lot of other kinds of planets that are like Earth but different in some ways. And there is a kind of planet that we call water worlds, which is a planet like Earth, but that initially just gets a lot more water so that it never develops continents that push up above the oceans. It's completely covered with water. And there's a lot of interesting question of whether life could evolve on such a planet. So there probably are water worlds out there, but this is probably not a realistic future Earth. Okay, let's skip ahead here. There's a, almost a familiarity to this from uh, thinking about astronauts in a, in a space capsule and having to recycle all their water and basically drink their own piss, although, you know, nicely filtered and hopefully conditioned well. And I see him doing that, and at first I think, oh, that makes sense, he's keeping his water and filtering it. But the difference between this and astronauts in a space capsule is that he's surrounded by water. Now, he can't drink it because it's salt water. But what I'm wondering is, is it really that much easier to filter and recycle your piss than to desalinate salt water? In theory, you could do either. It takes some energy and some effort, but I'm not sure about that. Maybe the pee would be easier to recycle. At times when it didn't, he'd have to manufacture fresh water either from the ocean or from his own reused bodily fluids. And yeah, the plant, same thing. Most plants can't handle salt water like us. They need fresh water. so he. If he wanted the company of his uh, vegetable companion, he'd have to give it fresh water too. All right, let's fast forward here through another part of Waterworld. Okay, so here we see Kevin Costner breathing underwater, or at least Kevin Costner's character, which leads to the question, could people evolve gills? I don't see this happening naturally, biologically. In other words, if the world gets flooded, some mutant humans are gonna be born with gills and then they survive better and give you know, birth to a sub-race of humans with gills. I don't see evolution really working that way. But in a way, our closest analogies in the ocean are the, the whales and dolphins. And they didn't develop gills. What they developed was the ability to hold their breath underwater and dive, and then they go to the surface to breathe and they have lungs. If it was that easy to develop gills, why didn't dolphins and whales develop gills? Uh-huh. Tell me that evolution. <laughs> so would it be more realistic for Kevin Costner to have a blowhole? Yeah, yeah. I, I think Kevin Costner should have a blowhole here, not, not gills. <laughs> when they make Waterworld 2. <laughs> All right, let's check out 12 Monkeys. Five billion people died in 1996 and 1997. You believe 1996 is the present then? Is that it? 
1996 is the past two. Listen to me. I think this is great. I, Bruce Willis is so good in this role. You can see that, that you know, they have every reason to believe he's nuts because he's spouting this, this ridiculous story uh, about time travel. I love the way that's set up. And the depiction of the end of the world in this film, again, sort of frighteningly realistic in that the notion of a world-ending disaster because of some biological agent that humans are defenseless against. You know, it's not necessarily an imminent threat, but there's a logic to it. Man made dire prognostications about a pestilence, which he said would wipe out humanity in approximately 600 years. Obviously, this plague doomsday scenario is considerably more compelling when reality supports it with a virulent disease. Whatever the infecting agent is, is something that's been evolving on Earth with us for billions of years and is part of our, you know, biological system that's sort of out of whack. But if you have somebody deliberately engineering something that there's no defenses against, there's potential that that could happen. That's why it's so unnerving about the fact that biological engineering is sort of getting easier and easier because it potentially puts it in the hands of people with, you know, less and less sort of institutional um, allegiance, <laughs> you know? People have counter arguments about private, why that probably wouldn't happen, and it's not totally clear that it would, but it's, it's certainly based on a premise that has a realistic uh, scientific uh, rationale. Yeah, so here we see New York City. It's obviously been overrun for a while. The plants are growing up in the streets and through some of the buildings, and there's wildlife running through the streets, herds of deer. This looks pretty realistic to me. I often wonder about what's gonna happen to cities when and if the humans disappear. And, and sometimes you'll, you'll be in a place, a part of New York or part of some other city where for some reason it's been a little block or a, a lot or something has been abandoned and the city's still there, but it's kind of re reverting to forest slowly. <laughs> so you're gonna have the grass growing tall and out of control and other um, volunteer species moving in and it's gonna, you know, go wild like this. It's gonna take longer for the streets to become fields. It's not gonna happen overnight. The pavement has to erode and sort of be worn down by biology and have stuff grow up and, you know, crack the pavement. So it's gonna be a number of years before the streets look like fields. It's hard to tell from, from this clip how many years it's supposed to be. All the cars are still there and the streets looking pretty, pretty fresh. They're not rusted out or anything, at least as I could see right there. I'm not sure the, the streets themselves are gonna that quickly turn into fields, but they will eventually. Okay, let's skip ahead here. No good. This is uh, really scary and, and I think pretty well done in that one can imagine if there's a really widespread disease and a biological emergency in a, you know, a crowded modern city like this, there might be a need for, for triage which is that if you're gonna save anybody, you have, have to not save some people. It's sort of a horrible thing to contemplate and, and to depict here. You know, triage is a real response to certain kinds of emergencies. And it's de depicted in kind of a brutal way that you can imagine if things were on the edge of chaos and the authorities were struggling to maintain control and this was the only way to prevent everybody from dying that you, you could end up in a situation like this. Now there's just corn. And we're growing more than we ever have. What, well, with like the uh, potatoes in Ireland and the wheat in the Dust Bowl, the corn will die. The notion that we could lose whole staple crops has some basis in reality. The food system is arguably more vulnerable than it used to be because we're moving more towards these sort of monocultures. And anytime you have a monoculture, things that are you know genetically similar forming the whole basis of a food crop. That makes it much more vulnerable than it would be if it were lots and lots of strains where a disease, a pathogen might infect one, but not, not the neighbor's field, which is a different strain. The specific thing I think that's happening in interstellar, if I remember correctly, is that the air is changing. The oxygen content is, is going down. And I thought that particular detail wasn't that realistic because there are things you can imagine we can do, you know, raising the CO2 level, which we're doing now, which if it continues on the wrong course, could cause a climate apocalypse. But 
actually lowering the oxygen in the, in the atmosphere is not that easy, and that's not really a threat. That would take you know, many, many thousands of years, even if you stopped making new oxygen. But the notion that we've changed the planet in some way that's making it harder to grow food is certainly uh, not, um, not that hard to imagine. We're not meant to save the world. We're meant to leave it. The idea that someday people will try to go live on planets outside our solar system is not completely far-fetched. It's challenging because the stars are so far away. You can't get to them in an ordinary rocket within anything like a human lifetime or a hundred human lifetimes. But science fiction is full of people getting around that by inventing fancy physics, you know, warp, warp drives, or generation ships where you have multiple human generations living and the, descend, the distant descendants of the people that set out or the people that reached that other world. And it could happen someday. The thing that seems unrealistic to me about this is that that's going to be a response to us messing up this planet. It's like, oh, well, we, we need to go live on another one because we screwed this one up. That really seems like a cop-out. If we are ever able to go live on another planet in any kind of numbers where we could, you know, repopulate the human race and survive, it seems to me in some much more far off future than the much more immediate problem of figuring out how not to destroy Earth's climate and overpopulate the planet and uh, cause a mass extinction. And so if you ask me, will we ever go live on planets around other stars? I don't want to say never. Given enough time, that's something that could happen, but I don't see it as connected to our current climate threats. But there's a kind of space industry, space exploration, that is absolutely essential to the project of saving the planet. Now this particular thing where you've got some hidden compound and people are getting ready to launch off and try to save themselves when everybody else dies, I could see people objecting to that. You know, I might object to that. And now, next up, the Martian. I have created 126 square meters of soil. But every cubic meter of soil requires 40 liters of water to be farmable. So the idea of farming on Mars is something that's been studied a lot by people at NASA and other agencies because we want to be able to send people to Mars and we want them to be able to live off the land because there's no way you could have any kind of a long-term presence on Mars and have to bring all the food from Earth. Just, it's too expensive, you're launching too much mass, so you, you want to be able to grow your food there. So, it's an interesting question, could you grow food in Martian soil? And people are trying that actually with Mars, Martian simulant soils, and it seems like something we probably could solve. I think farming on Mars is realistic. Eventually they'll be able to do it, but as I understand this story, the premise is that they weren't actually planning on doing this. It was, uh, they're not at that point yet where they sent up a colony that had, was really prepared to do this, and he's improvising. And that seems like he'd have to, he's obviously very clever, but he'd also have to get really lucky because there's going to be a lot of factors. I mean, there's a balance, a lot of things that can go awry. I think it might be harder to grow food on Mars than is depicted in here, but I also think it is possible. So using the hydrazine from the rocket to separate into nitrogen and, and hydrogen, and then using the hydrogen to make water, I mean, that's realistic. The, he's worked out, the, the author of this has worked out the chemistry, but I'm not sure the biology part is gonna be as easy as he, as he thinks. I think that humans will eventually live on Mars, but as a post-apocalyptic way to survive on Earth, it's. It doesn't make much sense. I mean, it's certainly nothing to hope for because the idea that most people die and then a few people go get to live on Mars, it's like, yay, humans. You know, it's like, that's kind of, that's a pretty dismal scenario. But also, the post-apocalyptic world is probably not the best world in which to innovate and have the resources to figure out how to go live on Mars. So I think it's more likely than in a thriving world that then you have the, the scientific expertise and the resources and the support back on Earth to make the effort to go eventually build a sustained society on Mars. I think it's going to be harder to live on Mars than people currently think. I bet there's going to be failure before there's success. So it's easier for me to imagine that happening in a pre-apocalyptic world where there's the innovation and industry and support on Earth to do the trial and error that's going to be needed. Okay, let's take a look at Ad Astra. Good morning. Good 
morning to our astronauts up there on the International Space Antenna. Sure is a beautiful day. There is this idea that, that, that you could build a space elevator using a tether that was attached to the Earth and extended all the way into orbit. And the physics work out. If you had the right material that had the right tensile strength, it couldn't be that heavy, but it'd have to be really strong. And people want to make it out of these, you know, new kinds of like carbon nanofibers and things like that, that if, if they come up with the right material, you could build a space elevator. And then the, the idea is you climb up this rope or you essentially have elevators that run up and down it, and it takes a lot less energy to get into orbit than it does with a rocket. So it actually is phys physically realistic if you could make the right materials, and people are, are working on it. Control, I'm seeing a power surge on sea post. You getting that? If these guys are in space, they're not going to hear anything coming through the air. There is no air. But they might hear the pulse, the electromagnetic pulse coming over their radio sets. And I imagine it would have that kind of a wave sound, that wub, 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 you know, that I've never heard an electromagnetic pulse. But that, that seems reasonable to me that it could have that kind of a, a wave sound piercing through their headsets. The uncontrolled release of antimatter could ultimately threaten the stability of our entire solar system. All life could be destroyed. Antimatter is real, and the notion that you, if you could isolate antimatter, that you could use it for space propulsion is a real idea that at least theoretically people have toyed with, and of course on Star Trek you've got the matter-antimatter engines, and that, that's riffing off of a real thing, which is that if antimatter encounters matter, it makes a tremendously powerful explosion. It would be a way to convert a small amount of mass to a huge amount of energy, which, which is great if you want to fuel a spacecraft. You don't want to bring a lot of mass, but you want something that's going to keep on giving you energy. So that's, it's a good idea. But we don't really know how to isolate antimatter. We can make atoms of antimatter, individual atoms, or even small molecules in, in the lab that last for, you know, some ridiculous um, a nanosecond or a femtosecond. <laughs> but, but the idea that we could make a container full of it and then take it on board a spaceship, it's still a science fiction dream. But I, I, I see the premise here that they've figured out how to do that, and that's how they're powering their deep space mission. That, that doesn't seem impossible. I don't know what the specific thing happening out near Neptune would be, but certainly one can imagine things that would happen out near Neptune that would affect the Earth. I mean, in the galaxy, there are natural things that happen that are powerful enough that if one happened to put out super powerful f flares with radiation that would sterilize all life and things like that, things like that happen in the universe. And if you were the distance from Earth to Neptune, from one of those explosions or flares or something, you'd be in trouble. So if you, if you imagine that there was something that happened out in Neptune that was that powerful, then yeah, Earth, Earth would be in trouble. Fast forward right here. Lunar rover set for departure to the far side launch complex. I don't see it as unreasonable that you could have some sort of a city or colony of people on the moon. It would you know, obviously take a lot of resources to build, but there are people that want to do such things, and there's nothing physically impossible. I mean, you have to solve the problems of you're going to need energy, you're going to need water, you're going to need food. So there's nothing about seeing this scale of, act of human activity and human habitation on the moon that strikes me as physically impossible. It's just a matter of having the, uh, the, the money and the, uh, the political will to uh, decide to do it. Okay, well now we have to check out Wally. I love this movie. Wally is, is is a great great film, and there there are a few things about it that are oddly realistic, where you're descending through that layer of space debris. That's a real thing that can happen, and it's a concern now that we're putting so much stuff out there that if you can get this cascade where if satellites are out of control and start to collide into each other, that creates more debris, which creates more collisions. So it's, a, it's an actual real concern that you could end up with this sort of impassable um, ring of space debris that makes it harder to, you know, do anything in orbit other than just like get hit with debris. You know, this world, it's, it's kind of a worst case scenario. You see the windmills and the nuclear cooling tanks 
So it looks like you're getting this quick glimpse of this planet where they tried alternative energy of various kinds and tried to save themselves, but they just got overrun in their own garbage and then, you know, basically lost it. And, you know, it's a cartoon, so you can get away with a lot, but the, the notion that we are threatened by just making too much stuff and it piling up is, is kind of a wonderful way to encapsulate one of our real challenges now of humans in the 21st century, realizing that the Earth is not infinite and that we can't just throw stuff away because there is no away. There's only one planet. You know, when we were much fewer in number and didn't occupy the whole Earth, you could throw stuff away and the world was sort of functionally infinite. But now we're, we're realizing it's finite. And if we don't deal with that, then the end result is WALL-E. So touching, the romance between Wally and, and Eva. I'm always moved. <laughs> you know, I, I, it's very, very hard to completely wipe out life from a planet like Earth. The Earth has been through some mass extinctions before where, you know, really horrible things happen and wipe out most life. But life is very, very tenacious and it's very ingrained in the planet. So most disasters that would wipe out human civilization or even the human race would not even come close to wiping out the biosphere. The biosphere would sort of shrug us off and keep going. I mean, it's happened over and over again. The biosphere is not fragile. We're fragile. Our civilization is fragile, but you're not gonna wipe out all life from Earth. So yeah, floods, asteroids, volcanoes, all that stuff, all real threats. Maybe not completely realistic as depicted in the movies always, but real, real things to worry about. And then there's the, you know, the biological disaster, the genetic engineering accident, the, 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 the mutant that gets out of the lab and wipes out all life. And again, there's a realistic component to that worry. <laughs> so, so all these things, uh, Hollywood maybe runs off with them in directions that make scientists go, hmm, you know, not not quite, but they're all real threats. Thanks for listening to me talk about post-apocalyptic worlds. May we never see any of them come true.